Hello and welcome to a new episode of This Week in BJJ. I'm Budo Jake, and today we're going to recap EBI4, talk about ADCC 2015, and then Tim Sled is my special guest. Let's get to it. Before we get into it, I want to thank our sponsor, Kali Cure. Kali Cure is the best way to deal with cauliflower ears. If you haven't had cauliflower ears, consider yourself lucky because grapple long enough and you probably will. Kali Cure is an innovative product that you can use over and over again, so it's a good thing to uh, purchase so you have it when you need it. You can just keep it at home or at your academy and uh, it's check it out on collicure.com or buddhavideos.com. It's a great way to safely cure cauliflower ear. So last weekend was EBI4 and it was a big success. Uh, Eddie Bravo again showed that he knows a lot about what he's doing. The uh, tournament was, uh, was so exciting. Everybody seemed to have a good time, whether they were there live or watching online. We had a 16-man tournament and um, three super fights. And again, the teenage girls really brought everybody to their feet. Um, and it's just amazing. You know, Eddie had a great vision uh, of, of really pushing these teenage women, and they put on a great show. If you haven't seen the replay, you can still check it out at buddhavideos.com slash EBI4. The replay will be available for the rest of August. And uh, now I'm going to talk about a couple spoilers. So if you haven't watched the event and you don't want to know what happened, you might want to fast forward about five minutes or so. But, um, you know, wow, Eddie Cummings really showed the world that uh, he is a black belt to pay attention to. He had incredible heel hooks throughout the tournament, and guys that that knew what they were doing, um, knew how to defend heel hooks, still fell victim to them. You know, one of his opponents was Barrett Yoshida. Barrett had a match with um, Imanari a few years back, so he's no stranger to being heel hooked. And um, and Barrett survived the uh, the match with Imanari, but uh, did not survive the match with Eddie Cummings. Uh, obviously, John Danaher has an amazing system out there. He's proven it with his students, Gary Tonin, and now Eddie Cummings. So uh, I am so excited to see how Eddie Cummings does at ADCC at the end of the month. It's going to be amazing. But again, if you haven't watched EBI4, you really should. It's a super exciting tournament. The overtime rules are really interesting and uh, puts people in bad positions uh, where you might not usually see them in those positions. You know, someone like uh, Joao Miao. How often do you see him de uh, defending a rear naked choke? Well, you see him doing that at EBI 4 in the overtime. So uh, I think the rules are great. I really like the tournament. And I can't wait for EBI 5, uh, hopefully sometime toward the end, of the end of the year. But the next big event is ADCC 2015. This is the World Championship of Nogi Grappling. Um, you know, everybody considers this event to be the crown jewel of, uh, of Nogi Grappling tournaments. Every two years, it's in a different part of the world. This time, it's in Sao Paulo. So next week, we're heading out there. We'll be doing the live coverage. Um, you know, the stream's going to look great. We spare no expense to make sure that it's stable and super clear. So, um, and, and we, we're happy to bring this to you guys. So many great guys competing. With one exception, Joao Miao just announced uh, today that he is pulled. He's pulled out of ADCC. Um, not sure exactly why that is, but uh, somebody online said it was that he lost a little motivation after his performance at EBI four. Again, that's only third. Per thir I'm hearing that third person, so not sure if that's true. But that's what uh, was was said by someone online. But nevertheless, there are tons of other super tough guys. It's going to be a great tournament, including the super fight with Cyborg versus Andre Galval. That's going to be on August 29th and 30th and get more information and for purchasing the pay-per-view at buddhavideos.com slash ADCC 2015. There is a discount if you purchase both days, both Saturday and Sunday. All right, guys, uh, no new products this week. Now we're going to go straight into the interview. This is with Tim Sled. And who is Tim Sled? He is a guy that uh, had a very successful career as a prosecutor. He gave up everything and moved out here to California to help Andre Galvao run Atos, the Atos Jiu Jitsu team. And he has an academy in Oceanside. Uh, very talented instructor, very well spoken guy. I had a great time getting to know him. Um, I've talked to him only online before. This is the first time we actually sat down and talked, but uh, you know, I consider him a friend. And um, I think we uh, covered some interesting topics uh, from a guy, like I said, who just gave up everything for jiu jitsu. So hope you guys enjoy it too. 
Here's the interview with Tim Sled. Tim, thanks for coming on the show today. You know, we've talked before in the past, and I knew you had your school in Indiana, and then suddenly you're here in Oceanside, in Southern California, in Oceanside. What prompted the move? Oh, um, so I was a prosecutor in Indiana, and uh, before that I was a judge for a year, and I did criminal defense work before that, so I was in, in law, and um, I, you know, I appreciated and, and enjoyed being a lawyer. Uh, being a prosecutor was the hardest job that I've ever had. Um, there's a lot of um, burden on a person to do that job well. Uh, it, the, it's the, you are acting as the government, uh, and so when you're accusing citizens, you have to make sure everything's done well. Uh, we are the check and balance on law enforcement, even more so than criminal defense lawyers are, because mm. I, I was one. Uh, the prosecutor has to be the check and balance on law enforcement. I was blessed to have great law enforcement officers that I worked with, um, and uh, it, it, the, the job, though, of, of prosecuting people uh, is very difficult. And I was running jiu a jiu-jitsu school, and uh, you know, have a, a small affiliation and doing that job. And I just found myself being happy when I was doing jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And when I was going into the office every morning, sometimes when it would be dark when I would go in and dark when I would come out, no windows in my office, um, I wasn't happy. And my wife and I talked a lot about uh, quality of life, uh, living every day versus dying every day. And um, the right opportunities came up for me. Professor Andre uh, needed some assistance uh, with his association, and uh, he and I talked, and ultimately we made the decision for me to come out uh, to Southern California to work as his director of affiliate relations and, and also open a, a small school in Oceanside. So that's, that's the fast answer to how I got here. All right, you covered a lot of things, and I want to go into a lot of those things in more detail, but you started off by talking about your law background. I mm -hmm. want to get into that. Sure. Uh, did you feel good when you got these these bad guys off the street? Absolutely. Um, like I said, I took it I took it very seriously. Um, reviewing charging information, uh, reviewing uh, police reports, uh, helping police plan and strategize for uh, pulling uh, sort of the dark element of our society into the light and uh, and holding them accountable. Um, I prosecuted everything from you know public intoxication all the way to murder. Mm -hmm. uh, I prosecuted those. I had jury trials in, uh, in just about every type of, of case that you could have in there where uh, somebody forces the state to prove it. There's a heavy, heavy burden. It's a, the cards are stacked against the government, so it, you have to be able to, to make your case. And uh, without fail, uh, I sleep very soundly at night knowing that anybody that was convicted under my watch was absolutely guilty. And, um, and whatever the sanction they got was, was through the judge. But uh, most of the time I was very satisfied with that. Sometimes I wish the judges would have gone a little harder. But, mm -hmm. uh, How many cases do you think you were involved in? That's, uh, from cases, from char people who were charged uh, all the way through they were, conv they were convicted, it, it's a really high number, mm -hmm. I would say in, in the thousands. Mm -hmm. Um, I would have an active case load at any given time, somewhere around 300 cases. Um, now, I only, there were only 13 murders in my tenure as the chief deputy prosecutor, um, so that, that shows you sort of the, the, uh, the proportion, but from domestic batterers to drunk drivers, uh, burglars, child molesters, uh, I, I would say th well into the thousands. Wow. Mm -hmm. Are you happy with the legal system in America? It's the best criminal justice system in the world, but it has some of the biggest problems. Um, it's, a, it's a machine that isn't uh, optimal. Uh, the, the prison system, of course, is antiquated. It is, um, uh, it's been measured, it's been tested, it's, it's not performing the way it should be. It's incapacitating and warehousing people versus correcting people. Um, we, we punish mental illness and addiction with incarceration, um, mostly because of that's how we've been trained to do it versus that's the right thing to do. So there's broken components of it. The thing that works very, very well about it is the burden of proof. The fact that a citizen has uh, the advantage going into a situation being accused by the government. Uh, um, 
and so I, I think that's a that's one of the best systems uh, having having both won and lost jury trials. Um, you know, when when a jury hears the evidence and and makes its decision, um, you can you you know that that's what the community thinks. Uh, now the jury. I have my own opinions about the jury system and how it could be done better. Um, juries are influenced by emotion and and pomp and circumstance and theatrics. I mean, that's part of being a trial lawyer is being good at those things, um, and those can affect the outcome. Uh, but I think more often than not, the collective mind of a jury gets it right. Hmm. Do they do they get it right every time in my situation? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, branching away from law for a moment. You started a school in uh, Indiana called Small Axe Jiu-Jitsu. When did you start that school? And it wasn't always Nato school, was it? No, no, I, uh, uh, so I started teaching Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, in 2003 at Indiana University. There was a club there. And uh, I, was, I was blessed to be one of the blue belts that got to run a club full of college students. I was in graduate school. After law school, I went to graduate school. And, um, you know, I met great people, had a lot of friends. Uh, I, 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 there was a guy named Kadar there who was also, he was kind of the leader, and he and I were running it. And he and I were very different. He, um, he would uh, unabashedly say he's not an athlete, and I was a wrestler. And so he, he was far more technical than I was, and I was far more kind of grit and grind wrestling. And so we were, we were creating these um, jiu-jitsu practitioners that I liked, that were really strong and, and, and good characters. And uh, at some point I wanted to see, what are my guys gonna be like? Because these are Kadar and I's guys. Mm -hmm. And they have, they have a little bit of Kadar's flavor, a little bit of my flavor. And uh, the opportunity to teach at Gentry Martial Arts in Martinsville, Indiana came up. And uh, so I started building my own little characters in that, in that school. Uh, and I was driving back from Minnesota with my family in the middle of the night, and I was listening to a, um, a CD, a Bob Marley CD, and a Small Axe came on the song, and I was just, this kind of fits my philosophy. So in 2005, I named the jiu-jitsu program Small Axe, and uh, uh, we were uh, a Kaiki affiliate, uh, Master Kaiki, who uh, I was, I got my blue belt from him in the year 2000 at uh, Gracie Torrance when he was still with the with uh, the Gracies, um, and I stayed with him um, until 2010. Uh, he is largely responsible for giving me my, my fundamental Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu knowledge. Many of my concepts I learned from him. He's a fantastic wealth of Jiu-Jitsu knowledge. Um, great teacher. Uh, one of my favorite parts about Master Kaiki was he was always on the mat. Even uh, in his, uh, his, his later years, uh, you know, well after he would be competitive, he would be training uh, with his students. And uh, a lot of respect for him. Uh, and I. Uh, I was teaching an arm lock, um, a mounted arm lock last night, and this purple belt that uh, uh, came from another school and is, is training with me now, he goes, I've never seen this detail about arm lock, and it makes my arm lock so much more effective. It was day one Kaiki Jiu Jitsu mm -hmm. arm lock detail. So, you know, I, 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 I told him, I was like, that's, that's from my, my, my original master Kaiki. So, right. I, and let me in, interrupt you for one second. That's what I find amazing about Jiu Jitsu is I can go around. I've been to a lot of schools, mm -hmm. and I'll go to some place and somebody will show me a detail, I'm like, wow, I've never seen that. And they'll mm -hmm. say exactly what you said, like, yeah, we learned that from day one. Yeah. But then maybe I'll show them something that they've never seen. Exactly. Everybody has little pockets of knowledge, nobody has all the answers. You know, that's uh, one, of my, one of my best friends, uh, he's a black belt, Evan Manweiler. He's, he doesn't like that this is called a martial art. He says it's a martial craft. Mm -hmm. And he and I have kind of gone back and forth and he's explained it, explained it to me, but there's something to that the craftsmanship that goes into grappling, into uh, submission wrestling, into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Judo. Uh, are, we have to adapt and adopt different little things uh, to make it effective for you versus me, for you know, my student uh, Brian. You know, we have different body types and so we're gonna, we're gonna come around solutions in maybe the same way but from a different point of view mm -hmm. and it can be that detail yeah so, uh, and some little thing can make perfect sense to you and might might, might not make sense to me sure yeah. so you had your school uh, then how did you meet Andre uh, so I was um, I was Ronan uh, I had I had left the Kaiki Jiu Jitsu Association and I was a, a three-stripe brown belt and pretty much resolved myself to 
the concept of I was going to train with everyone, mm -hmm. and I and I wasn't going to worry about you know what happens next. And uh, Val Worthington um, was a Facebook friend of mine. I had uh, followed her. She was from Chicago, so I'd been following her. And for some somehow we started chatting on uh, Facebook. And uh, she's like, I was just like, I need to know who to train with. Who are some people I can bring to train? And she mentioned a bunch of people. And one of them, she said, hey, uh, uh, Andre just moved to the United States. Uh, check him out. I'm sure he would love to come to a seminar. Uh, so I sent him a message and added him on Facebook. And we started chatting. We became friends um, before he became my professor, of course. Um, I had him to my school to teach a seminar with no intentions of affiliating because there wasn't an affiliation. There wasn't a, there was Autos did not exist at that time, right? Uh, it started in 08, but it wasn't like a, it wasn't an organization. It was a group of black belts that were flying under a flag together. Um, uh, so it existed, but it, and he was a member of Atos, but uh, it wasn't an organization. It wasn't like a, a formalized, organized team. Uh, so you know, he came and uh, did a seminar with me. We hit it off. Uh, he was his wife and daughter were still in Brazil. He stayed at my house, and my daughter uh, Lily's roughly the same age as Sarah. So, I mean, he was homesick. I could tell, mm -hmm. but he he found some home with my my family, and um, ultimately we communicated, and and uh, he welcomed me to be his first American affiliate, uh, which was just a blessing. I mean, I, here I was, a small school in the middle of the country, um, uh, and. And he was willing to adopt me. So. Right, and I remember exactly when that happened, because uh, I've known Andre for a long time. And I'm like, what, why? Who is this first affiliate in the middle of Indiana? You know, yeah. so it's interesting how that uh, transpired. Yeah. How important was your faith in your relationship with Andre and hooking up with Atos? I think super significant. Um, it was something he and I um, jived on right away. It was very, very valuable to me. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to have um, a, a relationship with somebody that was deeper than, say, a business relationship. Mm -hmm. Even deeper than sort of a um, show me techniques and I'll pay you cash. Um, and he, from the get-go with him, that was the important thing to him, was, was the fact that you know, he and I believed very similarly and um, valued things the same, say family, yeah. uh, his, more than, uh, more than jujitsu, more than his competition record, the thing I admire most about him is how much he can keep the focus on Angelica and Sarah, uh, and God, but and Angelica and, and Sarah are a component of that for him, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, that's something I admire greatly, and it meant a lot to me at that time, and uh, still does today, but... That was huge, and right. so our uh, Atos isn't doesn't require you to be um, an evangelical Christian or a, a devout Christian. And we have we have people who are um, Jewish, we have people who are uh, Muslim that train with us. We have a school in Jordan, we have a school in Jerusalem. Um, that's all separate and distinct. But for me and my personal relationship with Professor Andre, it was it was big, still is big. Um, uh, I ask him to pray for me when I'm having problems, and uh, uh, we communicate on that level. Mm -hmm. So you say you don't have to be a Christian to be a member of Atos, but Atos is the only jiu-jitsu organization that I know of that is named, um, has a Christian name to it. And you know, you can take a parallel to say 10th Planet. 10th Planet attracts a certain type of person, yeah. somebody who probably likes to smoke weed, believes in conspiracy theories, uh, you know, just generalizing sure, here, but those are the things that the founder, Eddie Bravo, is into. Yeah. And then on the same token, um, Andre Laval is a devout Christian. So mm -hmm. do you think that, do you think it's wise for an organization to have that niche to attract a certain personality? It depends on the goals. Uh, I, I read a meme on Instagram and I, I screenshot it and kept it. Uh, your vibe attracts your tribe. Um, and. Uh, if, you're, if your goal is to be supremely diverse, then you probably don't want your figurehead uh, to be outspoken about anything. But when you're, if you want your organization to be honest, then you'd rather your figurehead show the cards. You know, 10th Planet is a very honest entity. Just like you said, you're, you're not afraid on, on your show to say, their marijuana is going to come up. Conspiracy theory, uh, uh, chemtrail or whatever, the chemtrails are going to come up. 
that's who they that's who they are and there's they're unabashed about it and professor andre would never hide his light under a bushel an old christian song i mean he he's going to let his light shine and if that turns folks away they it's probably better that they wouldn't be in that organization because they'd be disappointed if they met him sometime and he asked uh you know he asked to pray for them or something uh and it's been funny because i get all of the applications to be an autos affiliate and we get uh, Middle East, we get, uh, uh, and we don't hide what Atos means. Mm -hmm. They all know what Atos means when they're applying. Uh, and it's not, it's not something that uh, steers too many people away, I don't think. And if it, and if it does, it's not meant to be. Right. Uh, we, I think, uh, you know, I can't speak for uh, Hafa and Guilherme, Professors Hafa, Guilherme, and Andre, and, and Ramon, but um, my belief is that they want to be honest. They, they would prefer to have an honest, honest organization than a massive organization of diversity where there's not a gel. Right. So you mentioned you came out here uh, and you opened up your own school, Oceanside Jiu-Jitsu, and then you're also helping out Andre. What exactly is your role within the Atos organization? I'm the director of affiliate relations. So uh, it's, it's multifaceted. The, um, sort of working from the, the inception of an affiliate, it looks like this. And a, f a person who wants to affiliate with Atos applies. I get their application. There are certain things that are automatic disqualifiers at present. Excuse me, the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the leadership wants high level guys, so brown or black belts. So if you're a blue belt or purple belt, Gotta it's, wait. it's often a disqualifier. Um, there, there's, there can be exceptions made. There have been exceptions made. We work through all of that, but I, I communicate with the person right away as soon as possible about what, what the rules and parameters are. Location, geography, things of that sort. I also filter for location because we protect our affiliates with a geographical scope protection, so I gotta make sure they're not in each other's backyards. Uh, from that point then, uh, there's a, a questionnaire that they fill out uh, to make sure they're gonna be a good business fit. Uh, that they're going to understand that they're they're running an up and up shop. Uh, we have an interview. We do face to face. I do Skype or FaceTime interviews with um, the potential affiliates, so they get to know me. I get to know them. There's a lot that happens in a in a face to face situation than on a phone or on a on a text uh, or an in text in an email. So I spend a lot of time chatting with people all over the world. Uh, sometimes English is a barrier. Sometimes not. Uh, and, um, and then if everything looks like it's gonna go well, then I begin the contracting process and I, I'm in steady contact with the leadership at this point. Um, once they become an affiliate, then my job is to make sure they get what we're promising them, seminars, curriculum, uh, if they need uh, clothing and things of that sort. Uh, Yolanda and Carlos are, are my two counterparts that work also in the association. You know, I'm communicating with them, I'm helping them get marketing out uh, we're trying to take care of the business needs. Uh, part of my job is to work with Carlos and Yolanda to do retreats, and in our retreats we do both uh, jiu-jitsu training and business training, um, and uh, so we, we, we host events, we do all kinds of things. Seminar management and, and getting the instructors to where they need to be for seminars, it takes up a lot of, a lot of my time and making sure people understand the requirements for the seminars. Uh, we consider it continuing education. In the, in the legal profession, you're required to do continuing legal education hours to make sure you're staying up on the rules and things of that sort. One of the, one of, I'm, I'm biased of course, but one of the best things about Atos is that, you know, there's some cutting edge stuff going on, at least innovation. Uh, you could call it modern jujitsu, it's probably on my shirt. Uh, but uh, uh, it's not something that if you've been, you know, 10 or 12 years with one association that's different from us, that you're just gonna automatically come into Atos and say, well, I'm an Atos black belt or I'm an Atos brown belt, I can do this. There's, usually, there's a learning curve. Like you said, uh, uh, you can, you've trained all over the world and, and sometimes a little, little detail difference makes a huge difference. Um, you know, and sometimes these systems are so different um, that it, it takes a little indoctrination and, and education. So that's, what, that's why we really wanna get the certified instructors that we have do our seminars. These are people that are at AOJ. These are at, the people that are at headquarters at Guto Campos School in, in Brazil. Um, they are, their finger is on the pulse. They're in their day-to-day -day training. Um, and they, they know sort of what we expect. Because I, I really believe that 
the Ahato Shu Jitsu Association has a, a different pedagogy, a different uh, style of teaching um, than I've experienced elsewhere. And it's part of that difference that makes their athletes so formidable for such a small team, so formidable. Would you say those, uh, is it a collection of techniques? Is it barambolos and leg drags or is it concepts? What do you think differentiates the Atos uh, team from others? A little bit of ever, a little bit of all of that. Um, you know, the the fact that the leadership is very open-minded uh, and very willing to collaborate uh, with each other, with people from other schools. Um, many of them have trained, like Professor Andre. He's trained with so many different instructors and athletes, uh, and taken something from and given something to many of them. He's very open-minded. Same same with Professors Hoffa and Guilherme and Hamon. Um, so I think there, there's something to innovating that's important. You know, the Barambolo, I mean, I don't know who invented it, whether it was Samuel Braga or, or somebody in Brazil or Hoffa Guilherme, but the fact remains is that the sort of the drive of that technique, the popularity of that technique was really an AOJ, uh, a Mendez Bros. Uh, thing and then the meows came and then they are innovating and it just it continues to grow the real difference is in my opinion the dedication to exploring each one of those positions to a point where where the position can possibly fail they've been to so many times that they have answers yeah uh, you can do I can do barambolo um, but if my barambolo fails I've spent so little time there that I'm not nearly as familiar with where to go from there mm -hmm. as, as probably a blue belt at AOJ. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the, the time spent you know, in, in, the, in the drills, in the specific sparring, in the technical training, trying to solve the problems. Uh, and composure is something that I always look at with athletes. And I don't know what about um, Atos has our athletes be so composed um, but that's one of the things you see. And maybe it's because the tough training camps, the leadership that is, their generals lead from the front. You know, they, these guys are confident because they know their instructor is going to go to battle that same weekend and their instructor's ready. And they know their instructor's ready. And they know if they've marched the same march that their instructor has, that they're ready to. There's just this composure that, that goes into that, that I think is, is, is a, an element that has to be. Uh, has to be there. I, you know, I, I competed in the 2012 PANS and I went in knowing that I was the best prepared I could be, best physical condition I could be. I was hydrated, nourished, and my technique at that point in my life was as, as good as it was going to be. And I was calm. That was the first tournament I'd ever competed in where I was composed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I attribute 100% of that to Professor Andre's road mapping for me, what I needed to do to get ready. Mm -hmm.